Thank you. <laughs> well, believe it or not, <laughs> that is pretty much the sort of thing that we do in real experiments. We have two beams of particles, subatomic particles, each of which is moving almost at the speed of light, firing in at each other, and just like there, most of them miss. Occasional ones hit, and it's the ones that hit that tell the really interesting story. Now let's see where this sort of thing is done. This is an aerial photograph just outside Geneva in Switzerland. The French-Swiss border is marked in dots all the way along here. And this huge circle here shows the outline of the accelerator at CERN, the European Centre for Nuclear and Particle Research. Now you can see how large that thing is by comparing with the runway of Geneva Airport that's down here at the bottom. Now the accelerator has to be that large because that's what you have to do to speed the particles up sufficiently because what we're trying to do is to recreate the conditions <coughs> of the Big Bang and you need a big accelerator to do that with. Now the actual accelerator isn't on the surface because that would involve you know, driving the thing through people's back gardens and that's not too easy to do. So it's built about 50 metres below ground. 50 metres isn't special, it's just that that was where the geology was the best to make this huge device and make it all flat and so forth. So this is the accelerator, the outline of the accelerator that's going to recreate the Big Bang for us. Now let's go downstairs and have a look inside it. So here is a tunnel which is in dimension about the same size as a tunnel on the London Underground. You can see two people standing here which is setting the scale. And along here these boxes are actually magnets that guide the particles around this huge ring. It's 27 kilometres all the way around. And inside these magnets is a small tube about 10 centimetres in diameter. And the particles live inside that tube and go all the way around that ring. The tube is evacuated, it's like being on the moon, there's so little air inside it because you don't want the particles to get obstructed as they go around. They're crossing the French-Swiss border about 11,000 times every second, but the customs decided not to bother about that. <laughs> so, that's what it's like down there, and we have made our own accelerator here in the Royal Institution, and uh, can I have a volunteer to help me drive this? Would you like to come down? Hello, what's your name? Hi. Right, let me show you what I'm going to do. If you will operate the yellow dial here, when I tell you, start moving it very slowly to the right. That'll speed things up. Don't, don't start yet. I've got to start the beam going. So let's get the beam going very gently. OK, now it's going nice and slowly. Now start speeding it up. A bit more, a bit more, a bit more. Let's get it to its maximum. That's it. Lovely. Hold it there. Thank you. Well, as you see, high-tech accelerators are not easy. But when they work, they get you there. And at the collision, there's this great annihilation, and trails came pouring out. And we've captured them for you here on the picture. So, it's the trails coming out after that collision. They are telling the story of what happens in that big bang, or in this case, that little bang. The trails show us that interesting things have happened. They don't actually show us matter being created, but they show us where the matter has been. Let's look at another picture here, which gives us an idea of the sort of things. So, in this picture, energy has come shooting in from here, and it's not an electron which goes spiralling round and round. That's a thumbprint that we all recognise in particle physics, the sign of an electron spiral. Now, the reason it's spiralled is because a magnetic field has made it go like this. But what's this on the other side? It's a spiral just like that, but all exactly opposite to it. This one is going that way, and the other one is going that way. The first one is a negatively charged electron matter, the stuff that's in all of us. The other one is a positively charged version of the electron, equal and opposite. It's antimatter. We call it a positron. It's got exactly the same mass as an electron, 
but equal and opposite electrical charge. And that's the wonderful key. It's electrons and positrons that if we can scale them up to a huge machine, we can put them to use. And we've got here a model of what it's like if you go down to that huge machine at CERN, deep underground, and here we've got the magnets that will send a beam of electrons around, say, clockwise. But the very same magnets can send the beam of positrons around anti-clockwise, anti-matter, anti-clockwise. And that is really neat. That's the key to this whole thing that the same set of magnets will send the two things counter-rotating and then you can bring them together and make the collision, recreate in that annihilation flash the first moment of the Big Bang and see what happens. Now, you've probably all heard about antimatter in science fiction, but it's real stuff. We use it all the time. You probably also know the story that if you're an astronaut and you go out to some star far, far away, you better check that it's a star made of matter and not something made of antimatter because if it's antimatter and you go rushing across and you see your anti-self and you shake hands so the story says you both disappear in a flash of gamma rays but it's actually not quite as bad as that your hands will disappear in gamma rays but the, the rest of you are pretty well untouched but that that is what we're doing we're firing beams of matter one way antimatter the other way annihilating them and that's recreating the heat of the moment just before the matter that we see today were made out of that original flash. So that is what we're trying to do at CERN. Let's see what an electron in that ring sees. So here's a view of electrons. Each of those bubbles represents a zillion electrons, all shooting along in the centre of the 10 centimetre tube. So this is inside the magnets speeding them up until they're going almost at the speed of light, fast enough that when they collide together, they will be able to do the job we're wanting, namely reproduce that first moment, and then we can see what happens. Now, what they're doing is heading towards the detector, the special camera that's going to record the collisions for us. Well, matter we're all knowing, but let's just first of all begin with a familiar piece of antimatter namely my twin in the anti-world. This is the world's most powerful telescope because with it we can zoom back through billions of years of time and catch a glimpse of the start of the universe. Now the beauty of it is we can do it time and time again so it makes it an incredibly powerful time travel machine. Science fiction's got nothing like this. Now the only way that we know how to recreate the immense energies and temperatures that were present in the first moments of time is to make a sort of subatomic train smash. We use tiny pieces of matter, electrons, and we smash them into tiny pieces of antimatter, positrons. Now that's not easy. The super powerful magnets like this, all the way around this tunnel, steering the electron beam, negatively charged, that way. And the really clever bit is, these same magnets can steer the positively charged positrons that way. So it brings the two beams around the circle into this violent collision that recreates the first moments of the universe. It's about 27 kilometers all the way around the circle. And the particles have gone round about a million times since I've been speaking to you. So I've got to get off to see that collision because they're moving nearly at the speed of light. Well, my anti-twin is always exaggerating. It doesn't seem much like the speed of light to me. Anyway, so he's heading off towards the detector. And here, my colleagues at Rutherford Appleton Lab have made a model of the detector. 